Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. A hundred years ago, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was signed, a deal that would help shape the future of the Middle East. It was the middle of World War I, and the Ottoman Empire appeared on the brink of collapse. A secret plan was formed to carve up its territories into spheres of European control. It was left to a pair of British and French civil servants, Mark Sykes and Francois-Georges Picot. Their choices were made in their country's best interests, but not those of the local population. The deal was officially known as the Asia Minor Agreements, but it will be their names forever associated with it and with the events after, which finalized many boundaries of the modern Middle East. In a moment, I'll be discussing this in more detail with our panel of guests. In the studio with me is the historian Avi Schleim. Joining me from London are the author Tarek Osman, and Rusi fellow Afzal Ashraf. And in Boston in the United States is a former US ambassador, Peter Galbraith. But first, Francis Collings has this report on the origins of the agreement. Conceived in Paris and London during the dark days of World War I, and drawn initially with a crude chinograph pencil, the secret plan to redesign the Middle East was termed as the Asia Minor Agreement, with vast areas under British and French influence. France had colonial ambitions, while Britain wanted to protect the Suez Canal and connections to its most important colony, India. The Sykes-Picot Agreement was named after Sir Mark Sykes, representing the British government, and Francois-Georges Picot, his French counterpart. It's a quote attributed to Sykes that showed the ambition as well as the folly of the task ahead. I should like to draw a line from the E in Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. Both Sykes and Pico were quintessential empire men, seasoned in colonial administration. They were believers in the notion that the region would be better off under European control. As the future spoils of the Great War were debated by Britain and France, vast areas of the Ottoman Empire were argued over. Pico was determined to secure control of Syria for France. For his part, Sykes raised British demands to balance out influence in the region. But among British concerns in redrawing the Middle East were the apparent promises made via a British colonel named T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. He galvanized a Bedouin army against the dying Ottoman Empire, hoping that full Arab independence would be the prize for Arab loyalty. The Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 killed those ideas. The areas that had been under Ottoman rule since the early 16th century ended up creating new countries and two spheres of influence. The Syrian coast and much of modern-day Lebanon went to France. Britain would take direct control over central and southern Mesopotamia, including Baghdad and Basra. Palestine would have an international administration. Sykes-Picot has been seen as a flawed arrangement. The arbitrary drawing of borders became the hallmark of imperialism. But this was an agreement laid down before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 before Russia withdrew from the First World War. It didn't account for the emergence of Turkey, nor did it allow for the future growth of Arab nationalism. But it was the beginning of what we know now as the modern Middle East, for good or for bad. 100 years on, the borders of Sykes-Picot remain debated and highly controversial. Francis Collings, The Newsmakers. Well, let's get stuck into the discussion now with our panel of guests. Avi Shleim, let me start with you. Bin Laden referenced it. Daesh now in Baghdadi, they reference it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of, uh, of what Bernard Lewis calls the sort of illusions in, in the Middle East, that when these people mention things like Sykes-Pico, everybody in the region automatically gets it, even though it might not be exactly historically accurate. People in the West generally have to turn to Google when they hear things like this. Do we give too much credit, Professor Schleim, to the relevance of Sykes-Picot 100 years on? Uh, today is the exact anniversary 
of the signing of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, 16 May 1916. Uh, and I don't think that we give too much credit to this um, agreement at one level, at a symbolic level, because whatever the actual consequences of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, in the mind of the population of this area, in the mind of Arabs, this is the ultimate symbol of colonial duplicity. It, is the, uh, it was a shocking document which took no account of the rights and aspirations of the people of the region and shaped an agreement to carve up the spoils of war, an agreement which only served the interests of the colonial powers. No, okay, interesting point there. Afzal Ashraf, let me bring you in here. Does the symbolism warrant the attention then? And is the symbolism sort of, does the symbolism trump the details? Again, I go back to my initial question. Do we give too much importance to Sykes-Pico and its relevance, or is it really a big deal 100 years on? I think uh, you mentioned uh, bin Laden and Daesh. Um, Sykes, Pico, like many historical facts, are uh, hijacked to produce political myths. And uh, one of the, the myths that the Islamist extremists want uh, to perpetuate is that um, the problems of the Middle East have come about because of um, arbitrary borders, uh, because of puppet governments, and that uh, should they um, take over the area, they can solve all of these problems by their version of uh, an Islamic form of governance. This is, of course, a myth. Um, there was, of course, a, a, a form of Islamic government in that area under the Ottoman Empire, uh, a, a caliphate which these people uh, now feel uh, was uh, something that they were deprived of. And, of course, Sykes-Picot is also hijacked uh, or exploited by other countries, um, other peoples, uh, who feel that they didn't get the nation state that um, was owed to them. So it's a symbology that um, people use to perpetuate their own particular version of history so that they can try and establish their own version of future. Um, the point is, uh, it was in many ways the sort of thing that you would expect to get um, in uh, that, that time of history, where you have great power rivalry, you have mm -hmm. competing empires that are negotiating rather like businesses. OK, Peter Galbraith, borders are often somewhat natural. They're mountains, they're lakes, they're rivers, they're seas, languages, ethnicities, sometimes religions that divide people. But then you have two white imperialists representing France and Britain just sort of drawing straight lines through complex people with complex histories going back thousands of years. That's how the region sees it. And they're right, aren't they? There's a betrayal there. Well, it, 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 historically, it wasn't just uh, Sykes-Picot. I mean, some of the, a lot of the blame can go back to the Ottoman Empire for unwisely joining the German side in the First World War. And then there were subsequent treaties, the Treaty of Sevres and the, uh, the Treaty of Lausanne. But the, the larger point is that the World War I settlement in the Middle East is coming apart, just as it came apart in Europe in the 1990s. Uh, the multinational states that were created in Europe after World War I, Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, disappeared. And now Iraq and Syria are coming apart. Uh, and it, to some degree, uh, a lot of historical injustice is being righted. This is certainly true for the Kurds, who thought they had been promised a state at the, the end of the uh, First World War, and that then was undone principally by the uh, Ataturk Revolution, the Republic. Uh, now in, in uh, the what we can almost call the former Iraq, they have a de facto independent state, Kurdis the Kurdistan region. You know, it has its own army, its own parliament, uh, its own passport laws. You need a visa to go to Iraq, but not to go to Kurdistan. And they'll hold a referendum probably uh, uh, this autumn on independence, and everybody knows the vote will be unanimous. 
Syria, the uh, Kurds in Syria have declared their own federal region. Uh, a, a, it's unlikely there's going to be a unified Syrian state again. If the uh, uh, Sunni side prevails in the civil war, almost certainly the Alawites will want a high degree of self-government uh, for their own protection uh, along the uh, coastal areas of Syria. Uh, so, uh, and of course the Islamic State, which controls both yeah. Raqqa and Mosul, is, uh, has already declared itself to be an independent <clears throat> country. That, that the old borders are gone. Yeah, you made some interesting points, and we're going to sort of unpack some of them a bit later on in the program, looking at the contemporary situation and, and wondering if there should be some sort of <coughs> tweaking and toggling of borders. We will dare to even ask that in, in a few moments' time, but I want to sort of rewind back to 100 years ago again and go to Tariq Osman. Tariq Osman, who were the biggest losers after Sykes-Pico was signed? Well, the biggest loser, of course, is the Ottoman Empire. But let me uh, let me highlight a point I think is important for your audience to to appreciate that the lines drawn in the on the paper by Mr. Sykes and Monsieur uh, Pico have nothing to do with the borders that we have in the Eastern Mediterranean today. So the the area that, for example, they gave to France as under the control of France is today in Eastern Turkey, primarily. Um, yeah. the lines that they drew more or less did not result into the actual lines that shaped Jordan or Iraq or Lebanon or what have you. These came in the five to ten years after by other agreements. I personally think that it's, it's important when you look at Sykes-Picot to keep in mind that it is not in any way um, a direct cause to any of the problems you have today in the Middle East. But I think it marked the beginning of the state order in the Arab world that emerged out of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And it is, the Ottoman Empire was, of course, a major loser. But if you, if you pinpoint that issue, that Sykes-Picot was the start of the state order in the Arab world exactly a century ago, and then you can say it was a top-down imposition of power by, as you put it, two foreigners, if you'd like, though they knew the region quite well. That top-down mentality, that more or less not paying too much attention to the actual trends on the grounds, of course, to the needs and wants of the people, continued for a long time. That was not the problem or the, um, the, the cause by Sykes or Picot or France or Britain. Actually, it was perpetrated by that and perpetuated by the Arab states that came after that. But they laid the foundations, not they, but basically the, the two empires, laid the foundation, the Brit Britain and France, for this top-down state order that we, the Arabs, continued with for the 70, 80 years after that. And as one of your guests said, that I think right now we have been seeing it unraveling for at least five, some would say, 10 years. Um, let's bring ourselves up to speed a little bit with the contemporary trends right now with Yvette McCullough. <laughs> Sykes-Picot and the deals and treaties that followed helped shape the modern Middle East. Carving out nation states along lines that ignored ethnic, religious and tribal links. Now some of the arbitrary borders of today's Middle East are moving or even disappearing. In June 2014, the terrorist group Daesh captured vast amounts of territory across Syria and Iraq. It released this propaganda video announcing the end of Sykes-Pico, symbolically blowing up checkpoints along the country's borders. Ethnic Kurds weren't a factor in Sykes-Pico or the Treaty of Lausanne, and their desire for their own state is playing out across the Middle East. In Iraq, Kurds were given an autonomous region in the north in 2005, while in Turkey, the terrorist group, the PKK, has been at war with the Turkish authorities for decades. And their wing in northern Syria, the YPG, is taking advantage of the fight with Daesh, trying to carve out an autonomous territory. The borders drawn out for the Jewish homeland in Palestine are unrecognisable today. Conflict is ongoing in occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and Israel continues to build illegal settlements. The 
longer this terrible civil war lasts, the harder it will be for the country to recover. Is it right to go backward to the ancient ages? No, the situation is different. We will continue our fight until weapons are laid down and not one single terrorist remains within our borders. We will stand against any attempt to harm Israel. We will fight for the right of Israel to live in peace and security and to exist. The scars left by the legacy of Sykes-Picot have been blamed for the conflicts in the modern Middle East, with some arguing it's time to redraw the borders. But what would remapping the Middle East look like and would it help to solve conflicts? Syria is being ripped apart by five years of war, raising concerns over whether it will be able to remain intact and achieve peace. While Iraq's unity government is struggling to rebuild and deal with deep-rooted sectarian divides. And last year, the autonomous Kurdish North was pushing for a referendum on independence. Turkey's government opposes an independent Kurdish state established by the PKK within its sovereign borders. And Western support for Israel and its right to defend itself has hopes of a two-state solution in Palestine fading. A century on from Sykes-Picot, can the idea of imposed nationhood survive? Or will sectarian and ethnic identities redraw the Middle East? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Peter Galbraith, uh, as you mentioned earlier, um, people talk about uh, a Kurdish state. There are those who talk about a Palestinian state. Um, as Avish Lay mentioned, you know, Daesh broke the border and they claim their own state. There are those who argue we need to start treating them like a state, uh, whether we like them or not, because they're in charge of the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. What do you think, Peter Galbraith? What would you change if you were given the power to change the map? I would decline the power to change the map because this is really not for outsiders to do. The map is being changed by the peoples of the region. Uh, and I think it is for the rest of the world to acknowledge and accept that. Uh, again, I, I come back to the Kurds in, uh, on the territory of the former Iraq. They have had since 1991 a de facto independent state with their own parliament, president, army. They don't allow the Iraqi army on their territory. Uh, they, have a, their, they control their own borders. They have their own visa regime. There's basically no Iraqi government presence there. Uh, and they want independence. And they're going to vote on it. And in the end, you know, where people in a geographically defined area persistently want uh, independence, the world basically accepts that. Even Britain ex acknowledged that Scotland had that right, uh, Canada, Quebec. Uh, and so it goes. So that's, that's the first area that is going to uh, uh, separate. Uh, that doesn't mean, incidentally, that the Kurds in Turkey are going to have their own state where there's really no possibility of it and where their aspirations are not for independence but for Kurdish rights. Uh, it's a little harder to see what happens with the Sunnis in Iraq uh, uh, because uh, uh, the history of Iraq was one of Sunni domination until the American invasion in 2003 when through the democratic part process Shiite religious parties came to power. Uh, the Sunnis have never accepted that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there isn't a Sunni force that uh, is acceptable to the rest of the world uh, that, that uh, is really speaking for the Sunnis. So mm -hmm. you, and you have the Islamic State, but that will never be recognized. And of course, Syria is uh, divided among many factions, uh, several of which have a, a national character, the Kurds, uh, the regime which is dominated by Alawites, uh, and of course the uh, uh, Islamists, which okay. is a Sunni. So uh, again, it, you have a, something that has unraveled and it's unclear where it goes. Okay, Afzal Ashraf, then let me ask, a hundred years on from Sykes-Picot, are we uh, in sort of agreement here that there isn't the appetite globally for any one power or more to impose any solutions on the region, particularly when it comes to borders and boundaries? I think that um, there isn't uh, the power, but also, as you say, there isn't the appetite. And I think that uh, Peter's just explained that um, in this age, as opposed to in the past, it is for the people to decide. And the only distinction I think that I would make, and I'm sure he would agree with, is that uh, people 
uh, should decide on the basis of plebiscite rather than the basis of power. This is where you've got people such as is the so-called Islamic State grabbing territory and redefining borders um, by, through um, power. And I think that that is something that is uh, universally recognized as unacceptable. We are running out of time, so just enough time to get final comments from Tariq Osman and Avish Lame. Tariq Osman, Sykes-Picot, an excuse for failures in good governance. What do you think? Well, in order not to take too much time, I'm around three quick points. One, the system did not fall, or the state order did not fall because of Daesh or ISIS. It has been falling for at least the past, the past 10, 20 years, at least. The, the ISIS or all the militant Islamists in that part of the world are just using a vacuum. Two, I, I found it quite difficult to imagine any kind of analogy to uh, a referendum like the one that happened in uh, Scotland, for example, happening or taking place in any part of the Eastern Mediterranean, save for Kurdistan for unique circumstances. You do have a system that was established 100 years ago, effectively crumbling for 20 years, and now very quickly falling apart. And you have a very important factor, demographics. Out of the 330 million Arabs in the Arab world today, about 150, 180, and under 30 years old, with the largest percentage of them, teens. They will not vote tomorrow in a very organized referendum. That will not happen. We know that will not happen, given the circumstances. So you do have, sadly, a long period of lots of confrontations, cold and hot wars, that out of which you will have not just a new system, but the notion of what the state will be in the Eastern Mediterranean, yes, will be shaped by the demographics, by the people. But sadly, it will far be, be, be far from an organized, smooth process. And mm -hmm. the question will be, out of all the problems we're seeing today, what kind of notion of state, what kind of legitimacy, what kind of, of political entities that will emerge in the next three, five, ten years? Yeah, OK. All strong points. Final comments from uh, Avishlam. Avishlam, the United States, in many ways, under President Obama has tried to extricate itself from the region. We see Iran that's resurgent, the Russians that are resurgent. Perhaps the Chinese will come in at some point. A hundred years from now, with all the various factors at play, do you think the borders are going to be the same as they are now? My guess is that they will be largely the oh, same. Oh, really? Wow. And here is a paradox. The lines drawn in the sand by the victorious powers after the First World War were artificial, they were unfair, they were unjust, they were illegitimate in the eyes of the population. But it was a package. And these borders have proved, for all their deficiencies, they've proved remarkably resilient, remarkably stable, with one exception, the border between Israel and Palestine. But when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990 and annexed Kuwait, he said the border between Iraq and Kuwait was created by the British imperialists and it had no uh, justification. He was right, but so were all of Iraq's international borders. So he un tried to unpick the package and the international community and the international coalition ejected Iraq out of Kuwait and restored that border. Today, all the countries of the region are committed to the existing borders, with the exception of the Kurds. They are challenging the old borders, uh, and they have an ambition to create the state, the Kurdish state, which was promised them in the Lausanne Treaty of 1920, but denied them until the present day. So with the exception of a Kurdish region, I think these borders are likely to stand for the foreseeable future. OK, gentlemen, it's been an absolute education. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Avish Lame, Abzal Ashraf, Tariq Osman and Peter Galbraith, thank you very much for joining us. You've been watching this special edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. We'll leave you with pictures of the key moments in the shaping of the modern Middle East. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.